All right, Leah, is it okay if I get us started officially? Yeah, I'm all ready. All right, well, good afternoon to those of you on the East Coast, and good morning if you're on the West Coast or somewhere in between. Thanks for joining us for today's Bloomerang webinar, Soliciting Bequests Using Direct Marketing Techniques. And my name is Stephen Shattuck, and I am the Chief Engagement Officer over here at Bloomerang, and I'll be uh, moderating today's discussion as always. And just a couple of housekeeping items before we get started. I want to let you all know that we are recording the presentation. Uh, so if you have to leave early or perhaps want to watch the presentation later on, you'll be able to do that. Just look for an email from me later on this afternoon. We'll get you the recording and the slides. If you didn't already get those, uh, have no fear. And please, as you listen to the presentation today, feel free to use that chat box right there on your webinar screen. Uh, we're going to save some time for Q&A at the end, so do not be shy about sending in your questions and comments. Um, and we'll try to keep it as interactive as possible, so don't sit on those hands at all. You can also do the same on Twitter if you want to send us a tweet. I'll be keeping an eye, an eye on that as well for questions or comments. And if you have any trouble with audio, we usually find that these webinars are only as good as your own Internet connection. Uh, so if you have any trouble, try dialing in by phone. If you can do that and don't mind, there is a phone number in the email from ReadyTalk that went out about an hour or so ago today. Um, and if you have any trouble with the visuals, sometimes changing browsers can help. Uh, but, but change it up if you don't mind. That usually gets rid of all those uh, nasty technical gremlins and such. And if this is your first Bloomerang webinar, I just want to say a special welcome to you folks. We do these just about every Thursday, uh, uh, all year round. It's one of our favorite things that we do. But in addition to that, our, what we're really known for is our donor management software. So if you are interested in that, uh, maybe looking to switch, uh, check us out. You can download a quick video demo. We're also now available in Canada. So any of you Canadians listening along today, uh, we might be able to help you as well. So check that out if you are interested in learning more. But for now, speaking of Canadians, one of my favorite Canadians is joining us today. She is Leah Eustace. Hey, Leah, how's it going? It's all good. And can I just say we're very excited to have you uh, entering the Canadian realm? Oh, thank you. <laughs> that was not planted, but I appreciate you saying that. <laughs> Well, I'm excited to have you. Uh, Leah, you did a webinar for us last year. It was one of my favorites. It was one of our highest reviewed. So had to have Leah back to talk all about bequests. And I just want to brag on you real quick. Um, in case you guys don't know Leah, uh, she is the president over at Blue Canoe Philanthropy. You may also know her for her work uh, at GoodWorks, which is a really excellent uh, agency. They do a lot of great work and put out some cool reports. Uh, um, but she has been in the business for over 25 years. She has raised hundreds of millions of dollars for nonprofits throughout North America. You will see why very quickly as she gets into her presentation. Uh, she does a lot of volunteer work on the side. She is the immediate past chair of the AFP Foundation for Philanthropy in Canada. She's a board member of the Canadian Association of Gift Planners and a board member of AFP Canada, which is newly formed, which is pretty cool. So very busy. Uh, she speaks a lot, does a lot of webinars. Uh, she writes a lot. She's a regular contributor to Advancing Philanthropy and lots of other publications. So um, I'm guessing if her name is new to you today, you'll see her name a lot more. You'll notice it. Um, but Leah, I'm going to kick it uh, or pass it off to you to tell us all about uh, bequests. So take it away, my friend. Great. Okay. Thank you very much, Stephen. Um, and uh, you, I do want to uh, point out, I, I wear lots of hats, and it can sometimes be a little confusing. Um, so, you know, my, my main gig is uh, with Blue Canoe Philanthropy, um, which consists of me, myself, and I. We keep each other good company. But um, I'm also, uh, my title is Chief Idea Goddess with Good Works, um, which I, I've been working with Good Works for the last 12 years. And... Much of the content and the case studies I'm presenting today um, were done um, with me at Good Works and the good folks at Good Works. So that's why <laughs> you see a Good Works logo and uh, Blue Canoe is just mentioned in this front slide, um, and maybe at the end, maybe not even. So um, uh, you know, I'm grateful for Good Works for uh, letting me um, kind of run with this wonderful. Uh, presentation and even more grateful to the couple of organizations which uh, we'll be talking about who um, kindly have agreed to let me talk about what they've done, how much they spent to do it, and what their results have been. 
Um, and all of you know that's pretty rare to get that kind of permission. So um, I said a big thank you to the University of Saskatchewan and WWF Canada for, for that. So let's jump right into it. We're going to start with this slide. This might be familiar, this whole iceberg concept. And really the idea here is that 10% or less of your plant giving prospects are on your radar screen. I would actually argue it's probably more than more like 5%. Um, you know, those are the few of them who've maybe reached out to ask for a bit of information, have maybe attended um, some sort of financial planning event, maybe they ticked off a box on a direct mail piece, um, or have some other, uh, some other way they've, they've kind of clung to your radar screen. Um, and those are typically the people who get assigned to a plan giving officer or some other development officer um, who then works at setting up a call with them, maybe a meeting, um, and you know, that's their kind of their bunch of prospects for the year. And you may have 10 of those, you may have 100. But underneath, hidden from view, are the 90 to 95% of bequest prospects, planned giving prospects, who really are just not on your radar screen. And, and you'll know this because if you receive bequests, a lot of time, they either come completely out of the blue from someone who's not even up on your database, or it's someone who gave you $25 three times over the course of 10 years. Just not typically the people who you would flag as being excellent bequest prospects. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you an example of this. My um, grandmother, who, had, who has passed away now, but she lived to the ripe old age of 91, and she, like many of her generation, gave to every appeal that came in her door, not much, maybe $20, maybe $25 at the most. Um, and when she passed away, she had left a few bequests. Uh, so, and, and she certainly had assets um, and, and money to give. But she never in a million years would ever have agreed to sit down with someone from a charity and have a cup of coffee or tea and talk about her estate plans. Never. She falls within that 90%. Um, so that's the kind of person, think about the people in your lives who would, would respond to a phone call or an invitation to uh, come for a tour. It, it's a very private decision, bequest making and, and planned giving. Um, and often people like to just do it completely on their own, the privacy of their own home. Let's talk about what I would say are the magic ingredients um, in terms of using direct marketing techniques for soliciting bequests. One is, um, when we all know this, powerful, powerful stories. Uh, it helps to have some insight into the brains of bequest donors, how they think, uh, what, the, what encourages them to give, what resonates. You need to obviously be able to figure out who your prospects are. You need the perfect mix of marketing, direct marketing techniques again. Um, and then in the end, I'm going to share these couple of case studies. So we're going to walk through all of these different things uh, step by step. And I hope by the end of our conversation, I'll have given you um, the tools and ideas you need to really take your plan to giving to the next level. So like I said, there are things you don't need. Um, you don't need to go and have tea and banana bread with every plan giving prospect. That's not what this is about. Um, and soliciting bequests or cultivating bequests through direct marketing doesn't have an impact on uh, those folks, those prospects you have who do like to meet face to face. We're really going after the ones who aren't on that radar screen. So this, what I'm talking about today isn't in conflict with what your planned giving department or planned giving person may be doing. It's just a different approach to help feed that pipeline um, to those higher orders of giving. Uh, the sweet spots for bequests continue to be older donors, uh, and many of those prefer to give to charity through the mail. Uh, in fact, research that GoodWorks has done in Canada shows that direct mail donors um, are about 
80% more likely to have a will than those who don't give to charity through the mail. Um, you know, only about 47 or like just about half um, uh, of those who don't give to charity through the mail have left bequests. So you really do have a lot of uh, bequest potential in, in your database and in your direct marketing file. So stories are all powerful, and anyone who's ever heard me speak, I, you know, I weave this statement into pretty much everything I ever say. Uh, over the past 50 years or so, we've, we've learned a whole lot about what goes on inside our brains, uh, and we've learned that almost all of our actions and decisions, including the decision to give, uh, are guided primarily by our intuition. Um, it happens really subconsciously, and I, I could talk all day about that because I find it fascinating how our brains, how our brains work. Um, our conscious brain has a very small part to play in how we think and how we act. Um, and what does that mean to fundraising? Well, it means in really simple terms, people give when their emotions are engaged. And how do you best engage people's emotions? Through storytelling. What are the characteristics of a good story? Again, it's probably a topic you could talk about all day. Uh, really, from my point of view and for the purposes of today, um, a good story is in the first person, told in the first person. It entertains the reader. Now, that doesn't mean happy entertainment necessarily, but it keeps you enthralled. It, it pulls you in, uh, and you become a part of that story. Good stories use a lot of describing words. So, um, you know, the, the sea is rough. It's, just not, it's not just there. It's a rough uh, kind of tumultuous sea. Um, or a, a, a windy day, you can hear, hear the wind whistling through the leaves. Lots of describing words. And stories are usually told in the past tense. The other thing about a good story, especially when it comes to planned giving, is often you will weave in a sense of autobiography. Um, if anyone knows the research of Russell James, and hopefully you all do, uh, he has done MRI studies of, of the brains of bequest donors, and he fa has found that um, the, the autobiographical, par autobiographical part of their brain is triggered when they start thinking about leaving a bequest. So in my mind, an excellent story also allows the reader to become part of that story. So you're, you're giving just enough detail um, to tell a good story, but not so much that the donor can't place themselves into it. And I, I'll, I'll show you examples of that. So I've done lots of, been part of a lot of focus groups and surveying and research around uh, bequest donors. And at the end of the day, donors, they know already how to leave a bequest. Um, and just in case you're wondering why I'm talking about bequests almost exclusively, it's because in Canada, 95% of planned gifts are bequests. In the States, it's about 90% and maybe slightly more. So uh, if you have a limited budget, limited time, um, limited real estate on your website, it, you should be very bequest-focused. That's really where the money is. So you know, what about the, you know, the, the terminology we use. It's funny because Stephen and I had a quick chat about this before we went live. Um, I suspect if I ask you all to put your hands up, uh, if you use the words planned giving or legacy giving on your website, I would see a lot of hands up. I don't think we can do that virtually, but you know, just do it in the privacy of wherever you are. Um, it, the, the thing about those terms is that donors don't understand what they mean. Uh, I've done all these focus groups I've done. Planned giving just doesn't make any sense to them. They, they just don't understand the terminology. When you start talk, asking them what they think legacy giving is, they'll say things like, oh, that's when you get your name up on a building. Um, and, you know, they see it as a, a, very, a very lofty thing, not for them. Uh, it's for people with a lot of money here and now, and, and they think more in terms of major gifts. Um, I'd also get you to put up your hand if the planned giving information on your website is mostly about the how of planned gifts. So, for example, sample bequest language, um, 
uh, maybe he's got a couple of scenarios in there, different kind of financial models and calculators. Uh, in actual fact, donors, the majority of donors know what a bequest is, and they know how to make a bequest. What they want to know is not how to do it. They want to know why they should do it with you. Um, in fact, donors get a little offended if we start telling them how to do it. They don't see it as the charity's place to be giving them that kind of guidance. Um, so we need to stop talking about how to leave a bequest. We need to start talking about why. Um, how do we do that? We talk about um, things that would inspire the donor, the future that we believe in, T talk about our hopes and dreams um, for the cause, and show them what, uh, what you'll be able to accomplish and the amazing things you'll be able to do in the next 15, 25, 100 years. What kind of bequest stories work? Uh, I've done a lot of them in my time, and, and these tend to be, um, in fact, there's almost, I would say they're probably in order of, of effectiveness. So telling the story of a bequest donor, a living bequest donor, what motivated her? Uh, how did she become involved in your cause? What difference has her bequest made? How did she provide for her family and her favorite charity? And you see there you're kind of uh, um, dealing with an objection before it has a chance to be spoken. Um, you can deal with your family and provide for your family and leave a bequest. Um, in the first person is always best. And again, I'll share some examples. Visionary or, or leader story. So tell the story of the chair of your board. Why does he or she volunteer so much time and energy to your cause? And why has he or she made the decision to give a bequest? Those can be very powerful stories. Write the story of the people who founded your organization. Uh, if they're still around, uh, all the better. If not, then telling their story on their behalf. Um, you can bet there's a huge amount of passion in that story, and it's, if you haven't told it already, it's, it's waiting to be told. Uh, invite a direct beneficiary of your work to tell their story. It could be a patient at the hospital, a student at the university, a former resident of a women's shelter, um, and again, we'll share an example when it comes to the case studies. Have the surviving loved ones of a bequester tell their story. These can be quite powerful as well. Um, or tell the story of a donor who's passed on, and, and that can be done really creatively um, and respectfully and be pretty powerful as well. Um, so just an important note here when it comes to the storytelling and, and the teller of the stories, older donors do tend to hold the staff and volunteer leadership in very high regard. Uh, so how your CEO or your board president is perce perceived, especially their integrity, might actually end up dictating whether or not a donor leaves a request. So, um, so that's why including that sort of visionary leader message uh, in your mix of messages is, is really important. Kind of that voice of authority. So uh, here is probably get all your money's worth in one slide here, I hope. Um, I'm going to let you in on a little bit of a secret. Over the years, uh, I've worked with many clients who's paid tens of thousands of dollars to have their data analyzed um, by consulting firms and agencies uh, to come up with who their most likely bequest or plan giving prospects are. Uh, and I'm going to tell you in one slide probably the same information that gets pulled from those. Uh, and from what I've seen in the past, what I tell you here is about a 95% overlap with what you pay, can pay a lot of money to get. Um, so, here, here's, and again, these are, these are pretty much in order as well. Um, so look in your database. Look, look for your volunteers, your dedicated long-term volunteers. There's a huge correlation between volunteerism and, um, and the class. And again, Russell James has, has determined that. A volunteer who also occasionally gives uh, is a fantastic um, bequest prospect. Figure out who in your database uses the honorific myth. If you think about you won't have very many, but if you think about that, that's very likely to be an older single woman. Uh, myth is not used very often anymore, um, so it does kind of uh, give you a sense of the person's age. Um, 
number three, actually I wouldn't quite put these in order because loyalty is huge here. Uh, loyalty, um, both, it, and, and I'm speaking in broad terms, so I don't mean just, you know, as the donor who's given every year for the last 15 years. I mean loyalty in terms of volunteering, of taking action, um, uh, certainly loyalty in terms of the length of time on the file, but I, I would say that length of time on file is more important than number of gifts. Um, you want to have been on that donor's radar screen for as long as possible. So even if they only gave three or four gifts over, say, a 30-year period, they're a better prospect than someone who's given every year for 10 years um, because, again, you've been, you've been on their radar screen. And don't forget that donors have no sense of when they last gave. If you ask a donor who last gave four years ago um, when they last gave, they'll often say, oh, I think it was a few months ago. Um, they, they don't keep track. Then your, your regular givers, your monthly donors, uh, depending on the, the, the sustaining donors, depending on the language you use, those are your donors who give every month through credit card or, or debit on their account. Um, those tend to be donors who are much closer to your cause and, uh, and can be great prospects. Then kind of the, well, major, major too, although it's at the bottom for a reason. Um, major donors think a little differently than bequest donors, although they can often do both kinds of gifts. Then down at the bottom here, um, these are kind of bonus criteria. If you, can, if you can determine age, so for example, colleges, universities can often do this because they know um, graduating year. Uh, if you can determine gender, uh, females tend to be more bequests than males. Um, education level, is it plays, plays a role, marital status, and childlessness is a big indicator as well um, as, as for propensity to leave a gift. Um, much of those bonus, bonus uh, terms there that comes directly from Russell James. So again, I encourage you to check him out and, and read everything that, uh, that he's written. He, he has determined that bequests are much more likely over the age of 55 um, higher levels of education are associated with higher levels of bequests. Um, childlessness, really, that is, that's the single strongest predictor of including a charitable bequest. And childlessness is increasing, so, so that's good for all of us. Um, the unmarried have less wealth, but they do generate more bequests. So how do we best communicate with these donors? Now that we have, we have our group of prospects, um, let's look about what we know about marketing to them. And I'm going to again say, <laughs> please, please, if you can, stay away from the terms planned giving or legacy giving when you're communicating with your donors. The donors really don't know what that means. Um, I think that a much better approach is to call it what it is. Ask for a gift in the donor's will. Ask for a bequest, but even bequest, you know, is a little tricky. There's been research done showing um, compared terminology using the word bequest versus gift and will. Gift and will, much more easily understood, really straightforward. People know what it means. And you want to communicate to donors in the way that they want to be communicated with. So like I said before, leaving a bequest is a really very, very personal decision. Uh, donors take a offense if you start advising them um, don't use an aggressive approach for the majority of your prospects. Use a very passive one. They, th these donors prefer for you to present the information to them, then allow them time to think about it on their own or with their family. And if they want more information, they'll ask. But even more likely, they'll start checking you out. Um, they'll go visit your website, for example. In fact, more than 65% of them will visit your website before deciding whether or not to leave a bequest. Uh, think about that. Um, what does your website look like? How easy is it to find the information? Is it the kind of information they need? Uh, again, I'll share a real-life example of a great uh, legacy website closer to the end. So focus on bequests on your website. Keep it jargon-free. Think about that autobiography, that sort of walk down memory lane. Talk about lifetime impact. Uh, and provide the name of a real person to contact, not a 1-800 number, a real live person. Put their picture in there, in fact, even better. 
Uh, downloadable information is okay. Um, you will have financial planners, you'll have lawyers looking for that, so it, it needs to be available. And track, you can track your leads using surveys or forums on, on the site. Um, to, you know, people do fill those out. Right at a grade six level, both not just for your website, for all your, your donor communications. Um, it, 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 I'm just going to talk a bit about the impact thing. I'm going to go back to that because lifetime impact is a little big. But um, donors want to know what kind of impact they're likely to have. Uh, it's often harder to do that with legacy giving because we like to have unrestricted funds, don't we? Um, but the key, the key is to let your donor know that there'll be a need for your gift in 50 years, in 100 years from now. Um, and that this is a cause that your organization can help solve, can help make change, um, and that you can, can, fill the, can fulfill those donor wishes. All right, so this is the good stuff. Getting into case settings here. You know, we can talk all we want, but unless you actually see how it works and what kind of results you can expect, um, it's a very different story. So I'm going to start with the University of Saskatchewan. Um, don't worry if you don't know where Saskatchewan is uh, or how to pronounce it. Um, it's, this is a wonderful, beautiful university here in Canada. Uh, it has a very loyal group of, an alum, of alumni, um, beautiful kind of spread out so you can see the building behind there. It's just a gorgeous, gorgeous place. Um, and Good Work started working with the University of Saskatchewan. I'm thinking it's about four or five years ago now. Uh, and Good Work continues to work with the University of Saskatchewan. Uh, I love this photo because it really exemplifies <laughs> the awesome relationship that I have with Ms. Bev Cooper, who is the head of plan giving at the University of Saskatchewan. Uh, when I went to visit once, she drove me around in her little convertible bug. Um, and as you can see, we had a really good time. So uh, what, what did her campaign look like or their campaign look like? Um, they developed a brochure or we developed a brochure um, that was very different from what they'd had in the past, very story focused and meant to act as a follow-up uh, for those donors who expressed some interest. They had, uh, once we kind of dug into their data, and also based on, uh, Bev's done an amazing job of um, identifying different levels of prospects. Um, probably, you know, she's done more work in that area than I've seen in a lot of organizations. She's really uh, dedicated time to it. So we were able to find 3,200 good prospects. Um, and then over the course of a few years, we sent those prospects five different mailings. Um, and currently, that, those five mailings kind of came to an end, and currently Bev is rolling out a, a new wave, the same five mailings, but to a different set of prospects. Um, and I had hoped she promised to share the, the results of how that's going, and uh, I haven't received them yet, but I'll be happy to share afterwards once I, um, once I hear from her on that. So I'm going to show you what this all looked like. This is the brochure that we put together. Very story focused. Uh, it, you know, we did use the word legacy here, but in this case it was appropriate. We used a mix of stories. So talk, we told stories of people who benefited from bequests. We told stories of work that benefited. So, so both scholarship recipients and researchers. Uh, we told stories of people who had left a bequest. Um, and we devoted hardly any real estate at all to how to do it. Uh, so this acted as a lovely follow-up to folks who expressed some interest um, because it was quite different from what, what they had seen before. One of my favorite parts of, of their brochure was this is, I think, you know, their second last page or maybe it's the last page. Uh, I'm a big believer in letting your donors see who it is on the other end of the phone or email or a letter. Uh, so here are the three, at, at the time, the three planned giving staff um, at the university, and they're telling their own stories. And there are pictures of them. 
They've provided their direct phone line and their direct email address. And think about that. If, if you're considering a bequest, I think of my grandmother always. You know, maybe she's in her 80s uh, and she's got a question. Um, she's a little nervous about calling. How much more likely is she going to call if she sees, oh, Bev, oh, she looks lovely. She looks very friendly. Uh, she's smiling. And, oh, look, uh, there's her line directly, so I don't have to go through a phone tree uh, to get to her. Much more likely to make that call. Now, this is the, the – shows you what this, the mailing looked like. This is one of them. They all looked a little different. This is the first one that went out. Um, uh, sorry, no, it's actually the second one. You can see there's very uh, minimal branding, and that is something I encourage. We want this package to look like it really did come directly from someone's desk. So the simpler, the better. Um, Bev did have to work pretty hard to convince their communications department to let her do this. <laughs> um, they wanted branding everywhere and a certain look. Um, I know she also struggled uh, with letting them let her use the type of font that's used here. It's, it's a bigger font. It's, I think, 13-point Times Roman, very easy to read for older eyes. Um, this is a very genuine donor story. Uh, the stationery is really high quality. You can't tell from the picture, but it's like thicker stock. Um, the outer envelope was hand-addressed, um, hand-addressed using a machine. There are machines that will actually hold a pen and hand address for you. A uh, live stamp, a real stamp. Um, and the level of detail is really important here. Every single piece, every single word was carefully considered. Uh, I'm going to... Um, grab over here. I've got my desk full of all these samples, so you'll hear shuffling paper. But um, I'm just going to give you an example of the power, the power of story here. So this um, was written in first person, and it was from a donor, Diana Duncan. And I'm not sure how much you, of this you can read, but I'm going to just read you a little bit of this story. There's this wonderful quote, the power of creating a better future is contained in the present moment. You create a good future by creating a good present. And she starts the letter by saying, that quote has been rolling around in my head lately. I've been thinking about the impact I've had during my lifetime and what I can do now to create an even better future. If you're like me, perhaps you've been taking stock of your life. What do I stand for? What's important to me? I'm going to pause there because you see First of all, you, the use of the word you, we're pulling the donor into the story right away, and we're encouraging them to think back on their life. Um, so that walk down memory lane, this is all really deliberate. She says, you know, this is why I feel so good about the gift I've left in my will for a student award for first year pediatric residents at the university. It aligns with my passion for education and for helping kids to grow up healthy. It's a gift I was helpless to give my own son, David, who died in my arms at the age of nine. Um, I still get goosebumps from this story. And it goes on. It's a four-page letter. It's a very long letter. And it tells the story of what happened with David. Um, he died in her arms. Uh, he had a severe peanut allergy. And he died in her arms on the way to the hospital. Um, and she's a strong believer in supporting that local health care so that in future other mothers don't have to go through something like she went through. Um, and any of these letters I'm happy to share in full uh, for people who want to follow up afterwards. I'll, I'll give you a sense of what, now you all have my home address, I expect Christmas cards. Um, this is what the letter looked like when it arrived in my mailbox. Um, that address and my name are written by a machine. And you wouldn't know because the machine actually holds the pen uh, and writes my name and address. Um, so, you know, it's even indented a bit like it would be with a pen. Everything is deliberate here. That stamp was really important. That's the Saskatchewan Rough Rider football team. And people in Saskatchewan are crazy, crazy for the Rough Riders. So it was really important for us to choose a stamp that would resonate with people. Um, all those little details are, are noticed. Um, we also, although this 
package wasn't produced in Saskatchewan. Um, it was dropped in the mail in Saskatchewan so that it would have uh, a kind of a, that local stamp um, and uh, kind of be, have that cancellation um, stuff that indicated that it was local. So here's, here's the full series of what we sent out to donors for the University of Saskatchewan. Um, the first letter that we sent to this group of 3,200 prospects uh, was written or signed by a woman named Vera Pizer. Um, so she is uh, Chancellor Emeritus, 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 <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, and this letter had to set the tone for the entire series of letters. Uh, so the signatory choice was very deliberate. She is very much loved and known by everyone on campus and by all the alumni. Um, she, she has a powerful story of what the university means to her and why she's left a significant gift. Um, and she's, she's able to speak to that walk down memory lane by, by talking a little bit about um, the campus and what she's seen over the years and what joy it gives her. Um, and uh, and this, this package was you know, a slightly different size and shape than, than the others. They're all a little bit different. You can see, again, there's, there's really no branding at all here. Uh, it says a note from Vera up at the top. Um, and other than that, the letter is completely plain. Uh, there are no graphics. Um, the outer envelope looks very much like the one I just showed you. Um, and it, this resonated with donors. In fact, um, Vera was approached by folks afterwards, thanking her for the lovely letter she had sent. Uh, and that went out to 3,200 people, but it felt very much like she was writing one-on-one -on -one to folks. And then for the second letter, this is where we had Diana Duncan. Um, so very different. We went from um, Chancellor Emeritus, very well-known kind of leadership person on campus, to a, a donor with a heartbreaking story to tell, but a story with hope as well. Um, hope in that the university is, uh, hospital is doing everything it can to make sure this kind of tragedy doesn't happen again. Um, again, super powerful, a, a different. You can see the mix here. So we have sort of the leadership story. We have here a living donor. These were all sent about um, three to four months apart. Oh, no, not three or four. They were actually sent every six months. You're going to see that. You'll see exactly when they're sent when I show you the results. And then for the third letter that these donors received, and it's all the same donors. This is a series. Um, this is a student, a student who benefited from a legacy gift. And again, I'm going to read you just a little bit. I, you know, it's, it's one of the keys is to make these really authentic, these packages. So here's how it starts. First off, I want to tell you how incredibly excited and honored I am to be able to write to you today. It's not often that students like me have a chance to talk directly to someone like you who supports the University of Saskatchewan. It, it sounds like a student is writing this letter. Um, it's not sounding very academic. There is one coming up that sounds much more academic. It's super authentic and really genuine. Um, her gratitude for um, receiving scholarships um, and the ability to continue her studies is so genuine. Um, and again, it's a, it's a different mix. So here's we have a beneficiary. We go, again, we have a vision letter, we have donor letter, and then we have a beneficiary story. The fourth letter was a professor, is a professor and a legacy research award recipient. Um, and here he tells the story of how impactful um, the bequest that was made was to his work. Um, and how it's going to really advance the the um, advance uh, advance the the university and the research and kind of its place in the world. Um, you can see it's a little more formal this one. There is a logo on this because it is from a professor uh, that just made a lot of sense. 
And you can also see that this package included um, the story of the donor uh, in a kind of what we call a lift note there, uh, smaller to the, to the right. Um, so we do weave that donor into the story, even though she's, she's passed. Um, it, it directly connects in a very obvious way the, the gift to the impact that it had. And then the final letter, the fifth letter, was uh, signed by a woman named Catherine MacGyver. Um, so Catherine and her husband, CD, are living donors. Um, so, you know, similar to Diana Duncan, but a little different in that they are, they, they met uh, when they were very young, they met at a dance. Um, they went to the university together. They had to get married to take advantage of certain funds available to help them uh, with their education. Um, but they were quite happy to do so because they were quite in love and they've been married a very long time. Um, uh, Catherine shares her story of, of going through cancer treatment, um, shares the story of the impact the university had, and um, uh, and invites, in, in all of these, they're inviting donors to consider a gift, a similar gift. It's a very subtle, not aggressive um, uh, approach. Now, we've sent, we've done a brochure. We've sent five mailings to this group of 3,200 donors. Um, and this is what we see at the other end. So these were mailed in February and September, I believe, of each year. So every six months, the donor would receive a letter. You can see legacy mailing number one, the number mailed just under 3,200. The reason that that number goes down over time is because in every letter, we gave the option for the donor to remove themselves from future mailings. They could say, you know what, this is something that I'm just not interested in uh, and I prefer not to um, hear more about. So, so that number slowly went down over time. You can see the number of responses to each mailing and the response rate uh, to each mailing. So them returning the little coupon um, and response includes, no, I don't want to hear from you again, to I'd like more information to, yes, I've left a gift. Um, then the inquiries, so those are the, those are the folks who actually said, yes, I'd like to learn more about leaving this kind of gift. You see the percentage there. Overall, again, this is all the same group of donors, so it's really the numbers that in the darker yellow at the bottom that are key. So 1.21% asked for more information. The number of confirmed expectancies was just over 2%. And again, I'm waiting for updated numbers from Bev. Um, these numbers have gone up. So after the five series of five, they'd been able to confirm 65 expectancies with an estimated value of $7.2 million. And those are just the expectancies that they were told about. Um, we also know from research that's been done by GoodWorks that only one in nine donors will ever tell you that they've left a bequest. So um, although you wouldn't do it officially, you can roughly estimate that if 65 have told you, you can um, multiply that by nine for the number of people who have actually done it. Uh, and then the numbers get really big. And I'm seeing, I see we have some questions here. So I am going, I'm going to address those at the end. Just, uh, I will leave time for that and, and thank you. Um, it looks like we have some great questions there. So again, if you have questions about this in particular, just type them in and we'll, we will talk about it. Um, so WWF Canada, here's our second case study. They did things a little differently, everybody does. Um, so let's see how this worked with them, a little different. So their campaign um, included some website development work uh, to ensure that the website was in top-notch shape, the legacy portion, so that when donors did visit, they got everything they needed. Um, they also did a, a lovely brochure. They had exactly the same number of prospects, purely coincidentally, 3,200. They only did three mailings, but then they did a follow-up call. So they, they did it a little differently than the University of Saskatchewan. Um, but again, you know, this all has to fit, fit in with other things you're doing. Let's take a look at their website, because that is very unique to them. Um, this will have changed a bit since I did these screenshots because it's constantly changing. 
Um, but if you can visit their legacy giving portion of the WF Canada website, it's, it's excellent. Um, so you can see that right up front they talk about leaving a gift in your will, and they immediately go into that autobiography. Where were you when you first experienced nature? Maybe it was seeing a painted turtle in a local pond or the stillness of the woods behind your childhood home. Or the first time you saw the ocean, where were you? Um, lovely. And you can see they've got some great photos, of, a great photo of nature up top there. Um, their logo is much more subtle up at the top left. Um, big font, easy to read. As we scroll down the page, so imagine we're scrolling down the actual page here. Um, we have, there's lots of great stuff here on the right. Uh, folks who might be interested are invited to an estate planning seminar or session. Um, we move on to how that legacy gift will help. So here's where we talk about impact, and they share a lot of stories of what your gift will make happen. Then again on the right, we have a picture of the plan giving, giving person out in nature with her, her young son. Um, and as we move down a little farther on the page, you can see top right, she says a little bit about herself. Uh, there's her direct line, her direct email address, uh, so you know who you're calling when you pick up the phone. Um, we also have a little profile of, of someone named Monty Hummel, who was um, the president and CEO of WWF Canada for a very long time. He's an amazing man. Um, one of the letters that they sent out was signed by him, but very personal, uh, talking about his legacy gift. So his, his face is familiar and respected. Um, so again, very deliberately included there. As we move farther, farther down the page, we start to see a little bit of the how. So here's how you can leave a gift in your will. There are different ways of doing it. Um, you can download a full information package on the right if you would like to, uh, and in there you might find some bequest language. Um, and then what do you need to know? Well, finally, here's, here's the how, way down at the bottom. So you can see it, it focuses on story, um, story of donors, story of the deceased donors. Uh, there is a chance to fill out a survey, and they, they had a lot of uptake on that. Um, very simple survey that just asks, well, this doesn't tell you much, does it? But um, asks for a bit of your information and then uh, a few very short questions about, about legacy giving and how that fits into your life. Here is the brochure that was produced. I just, I love this one. I'm all about the outdoors, though, so that's probably why, but um, a, a beautiful piece. Again, very focused on story. Um, using a lot of deliberate language in here, for example, uh, you can't see it here, but one of the lines that they use uh, is, everyday donors just like you, which is a really powerful sentence to use in planned giving um, because we, we are creatures of habit um, and behavioral science will tell us that if we always look to what other people are doing before we make a decision. So if we're told that everyday donors just like me are making this kind of gift, we're actually more likely to give um, because we want to join the pack. We like to be told what to do. So again, very, very simple. This is the letter that was signed by Monty Hummel, the, the President and CEO, or past President and CEO. Um, I love up at the top here, Reflections from Loon Lake. He's writing this from his cottage. Uh, and it's really personal. It's, it talks about where his love of nature came from. You can see the coupon here fairly clearly. Uh, again, it's really simple. You have a few, a few uh, responses available. Yes, I've already done this. I'm thinking about it. I'd like to talk to someone about it. This is not the right thing for me right now, or please don't send me any more information. All of that is useful information. And then the next letter um, was a, from a donor, a donor talking about why they've left a bequest, and again, very personal, um, 
talking about you and pulling the reader into the story in a really effective way. Uh, once again, we see you know simple font, lots of white space. It's really easy to read. And then the third letter, again from a donor, um, minimal branding. You can barely you can see even on the envelope. There, there's no logo on the envelope. Um, and when you get these in the mail, I, when I get them, I still think I'm being invited to a wedding. They, they're highly personalized. Um, so that was, that was the, the last letter in the series. And then they did follow-up calls uh, to answer questions, to provide more information, um, to in some cases confirm the quest. So the results that they saw, um, a little different because, you know, it really depends on the organization, but they had uh, almost 500 of the original 3,200 uh, people who were mailed responded to the campaign. So they got 46 expectancies. That's 1.44% with a future value of over 4 million. That's Canadian dollars, a little less than US. Uh, 145 warm leads, so just under 5% with a future value of $6.5 million. They, this all cost them about $70,000. And the ROI, check that out. Um, it's huge. <laughs> very, very big. Um, so so that, you know, that kind of gives you a sense of what, what this can look like in terms of direct marketing um, or using those direct marketing techniques, communicating to people through the mail and on your website. Um, and, you know, I, know, I did notice there was at least one question, maybe a few here, because, and this always comes up. Um, what about tiny little organizations? These, these were kind of full campaigns. What, it, what even the smallest organization t can take from this is um, the identification of the prospects using those criteria I talked about, the way to communicate with those prospects. Um, and you don't have to send a mailing every three to four months or even six months to 3,000 people. Um, a lot of organizations I've worked with have a pool of a couple hundred people or even a hundred that they send these letters to. Those can easily be produced in-house um, and your cost is really a little bit of time, a stamp, uh, and maybe you know, some kind of follow-up brochure. So it can be scaled way down, it can be scaled way up, which is what I love about this. Um, you know, the key elements are telling a story, um, communicating in the way that they do, these donors want to be communicated with, um, and, and pulling them in, making them the hero of, you know, this potential bequest and what will happen uh, because of it. All right, Stephen, I'm going to jump in. You've identified a few questions here, so I'm going to jump in. Other than that broad statement, because that, that usually comes up, how do we scale this? Um, and it can certainly be done. Um, so, oh, I see a few familiar names here. Uh, Gary, you asked, uh, you've just developed a plant giving presence on your website with an emphasis on bequests. How can you tie that together using the Bloomerang email capability? Uh, that is probably a question for Stephen. Um, Stephen, are you able to jump in and talk to that? Yeah, Gary, I may, I may, um... I may uh, answer that offline if people don't mind, but it, it seems like you know the, the same principles that you just laid out uh, over direct mail. I mean, you tell me, Leah. Do you think those those same things translate to those electronic mediums in terms of email? Do you think that they would have the same impact as they would coming through the mail? It seems like maybe the mail, the physical copy, would be more impactful, but maybe not. I don't know. Yeah, I, I think it's fine to use it as a support, um, the digital okay. stuff. But at the end of the day. In this moment in time, the donors who are leading big quests um, are really responsive to direct mail. Direct mail is not dead. Um, when, when in all the focus groups, when we talk about how, how do you want to receive this information, um, every single time they'll say, we prefer something in the mail over an email. Uh, we get so much okay. email, open rates are going down. Um, but as a support, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, another way of sending out the message, another way of telling the stories in a different format. Speaking of the direct mail piece, a lot of people ask about the length of the letters. Leah, does is, is yeah. need to be one page? Are there any hard and fast rules, do you think? 
uh, the longer the better. Every single example oh. I shared with you today was uh, four pages. So two, uh, both sides of two pieces of paper. I've seen them go even longer. I truly believe that you can't tell these powerful stories in under two pages. Um, okay. you, you want to tell them deeply and include lots of detail. And, you know, I will stick to my guns on this, and a lot of other people will say the same thing, that every time I've ever done a test of letter length, longer letters work better. Um, wow. Uh, yeah, four pages up, I would say. So, uh, yeah, it's long. Now, I see there's also a question about using photos. Um, and I'm starting to see some uh, testing results around that, that, that including uh, the photo of the donor um, can actually help to increase response. Uh, it, it just helps kind of to build that connection. But what I'd caution is use an appropriate photo. Something really warm, like the, think back to that WWF website and the, the photo of the planned giving person with her son out in the woods. That would be an appropriate kind of photo, um, not a headshot, <laughs> uh, but you know, a close-up photo, the eyes are looking out. That can work. And we're testing for those who have the capability to do so. Um, and I'll get you to just cut me off, Stephen, whenever, because I, I could do this all day. But, um, yeah, I know. Jessica, this is great yeah. stuff. There's great questions yeah. here. Yeah. Jessica asked, uh, do you have any tips for organizations that don't, don't have any legacy gifts? Uh, so you can't tell the story of someone who chose to make a legacy gift because you're pursuing your first one. Uh, that's a really good question. I would say find your first one and know where your first one is going to come from probably a board member. Start by, by soliciting a gift from a board member, um, and then you have a story to tell. Uh, or, or even a staff person. Those can be pretty powerful stories too, but those are going to be your best prospects for that first legacy gift. Um, that's where it's going to come from, and then you'll have a story to tell others. Someone asked about cost. So, um, you, oh, you asked about the size mailings. If we kind of extrapolate from, I, I can get that to you. Um, I don't have it off the top of my head. Um, it depends on the number of packages you're sending out, um, whether you're going to use a consultant or not. Um, I would say kind of your hard cost per mailing. These, these are not inexpensive mailings. Um, you have to pay the first class postage. You've got the hand addressing. So if you're mailing out 1,000, you might expect Expect to pay somewhere between three and four dollars a package, um, roughly, really rough. Don't quote me on it, but uh, just to give you a sense of how uh, how to plan for that. Uh, let's see what else we have here. Uh, well, someone asked about the mailing list. So, so again, the mailing list is based on those criteria I shared. So looking in the database for the most loyal donors, um, those who've also volunteered, um, uh, perhaps some of your monthly donors, and then you have to balance that with the budget available. Um, so you may have 30,000 prospects, but you, can only, you only have a certain envelope to, of money to spend, so that you might find your best 1,000 prospects, or even your best 200 prospects out of that, out of that list. And, and loyalty is going to be the most important factor there. How are we doing? Oh, so many questions. I'm not going to be able to get to them all. Um, how do you calculate the future value of the expectancy? I actually have a calculator tool that I'd be happy to share offline. You've got my email address there. So any, anyone who I don't get to their question or has a follow-up, please reach out. Um, you calculate the future value based on um, what your average bequest value has been over the years. And if you don't know, then typically about $35,000 um, is what I would use uh, as an average size of bequest gift. But ideally, you take all the ones you've received, divide, it, divide the dollar value by the number, and that's what your average gift is, and that's what you can use. I'd be a little conservative, but that's what I would use for projections. 
Let's see. How much time do we have, Stephen? I should check. Oh, we're two o'clock. Oh, I'm not going to get to it all. Yeah, we are about out of time, but Leah, can, can people reach out to you by email or Twitter and maybe ask some follow-up questions offline? Oh, Is that okay with you? Yes, absolutely. Please do. And if you'd like samples, anything you'd like, just reach out and I'll put that all together uh, for you and um, we can keep talking. Cool. Well, thanks for, for being willing to do that, and thanks for spending you know time out of your day to share all this great stuff with us. Love the case studies. This is all really great stuff. Thanks so much, Leah. Oh, you're very welcome. And thanks to all of you for uh, hanging out an hour or so out of your day. I know it's a busy time of year, so I definitely appreciate it. Um, but do we reach out to Leah if we didn't get to your question. Obviously, she's a wealth of knowledge, and I'll be sharing – uh, the recording as well as the slides later on today if you didn't already get the slides. So don't worry if you don't have them. You'll, I'll get them to you today, uh, I promise. Um, lots of resources on our website as well. Uh, we've got our big uh, annual conference coming up, BloomCon. We've got some great speakers. If you're in the Phoenix area or don't mind getting to Phoenix in February, check that out. It's going to be a really good time. It's our fourth year. Um, going to be some great sessions there. and We've got some great webinars coming up as well. Uh, one week from today, we're going to talk about compliance, especially for the, all those online gifts that you're probably going to be getting uh, towards the end of the year. And then we're also going to be talking about year-end appeals two weeks from today. So we've got a lot of really cool sessions coming up. Um, so if you see a topic there on our webinar page that looks interesting to you, check it out. We'd love to see you again on, an, on another webinar. So uh, we'll call it a day there. Look for that follow-up email from me in a, in a few hours here. And hopefully we will see you again next week, uh, if not later. So have a good rest of your Thursday. Have a, a fun and safe weekend, and we'll talk to you again soon.